essentially begins as a clinical diagnosis. Um, and this is really important because when patients present with clinical PNI, um, you have your index of suspicion, particularly in a patient with prior history of skin cancer or head and neck cancer, should be extremely high uh, because even um, you know even when somebody presents with clinical symptoms, it often takes on the order of two to five years prior to seeing any abnormality on any imaging. So when a patient comes in with a facial numbness or weakness, and I'm going to show you several examples of these patients. Um, you know, these often go misdiagnosed for years, uh, particularly because the the diagno diagnosing physician will order imaging, and when they see nothing visible on imaging, they attribute it to a variety of other etiologies, like a viral syndrome. You know, like classic is Bell's palsy. It is not uncommon for me every couple of months to see a patient who comes in eventually with a known biopsy-proven perineural failure. Um, and they've had Bell's palsy, or they've been diagnosed with Bell's palsy for multiple years, and it really is a, a incorrect diagnosis that misses PNI. And even when you see imaging findings, oftentimes these findings are very, very subtle and can be very easily missed. So you really do need a good neuroradiologist with a keen eye to help you focus in on the PNI and these patients. Again, just to show you some examples, so if this is a nerve, um, perineural invasion um, is typically right, you know, around the nerve um, within the epineurium or the, uh, and the, but you can have tumor um, in the perineurium or the epineurium, but off, you, know, you can certainly have tumor that tracks along the nerve within the nerve itself. And this is how these tumors travel either retrograde or anterograde. Again, just showing you a, histo um, a histologic slide of what PNI looks like. So you can see the nerve right here, and then you can see the cancer surrounding the nerve right here in this patient. So, Again, as we talked about histologies for PNI, um, as I mentioned, primarily you know in the U.S. at least in cutaneous malignancies, and this is seen in every cutaneous malignancy: um, basal cell car carcinomas, squamous cell carcinomas, and certainly melanomas and Merkel cell. So there is a histologic subtype of melanoma called desmoplastic melanoma, which again, by definition, very similar to adenoid cystic cancer, means that de desmoplastic. Uh, melanomas um, are known for their predilection to travel along nerves, and they often present with nerve failures. Um, the next group of malignancies, as I mentioned, salivary gland tumors with adenoid cystic uh, um, histology being the most common, uh, but you can certainly see in other hist histologic subtypes of salivary gland tumors, uh, particularly salivary duct tumors um, often can have a lot of PNI. And then mucosal head and neck cancers with um, you know, oral cavity, nasal cavity, paranasal sinuses, and, and obviously nasopharyngeal cancers being some of the most common mucosal head and neck cancers that show up with PNI. So let's talk a little bit about some data for PNI. So this is looking at the epidemiology of PNI for skin cancers um, in the US. And this is looking at primary site of disease and patients presenting either with microscopic PNI, and so microscopic PNI, just so for definition here, means patients where they have no clinical symptoms, no symptoms on, no uh, imaging findings, but have just PNI found incidentally um, on, on pathology. And so you'll see microscopic PNI and, or incidental PNI as exchangeable terms, and they essentially mean the same thing. And then clinical or radiographic PNI. So clinical PNI is where patients have clinical symptoms. Radiographic PNI where they have both clinical and radiographic symptoms. And so you can see, um, you know, why this is an issue in head and neck cancer. So you can see for these skin cancers, um, you know, anywhere from you know two to you know 15% of lesions can present with PNI microscopically. Um, and then, you know, a similar numbers kind of for clinical and radiographic PNI. And so what you can see is, you know, various sites in the head and neck have predilection for PNI, but most commonly where you'll see is, you know, kind of in the V2 distribution right here. So right along, you know, tumors along the cheek can go in, into the infraorbital foramen. Um, and that's the most common way that you'll see PNI for skin cancers in these patients. Um, PNI um, can be also associated with stage. So you can see, um, you know, as as you go advance along your T stage, the, the likelihood of PNI is higher. Um, and you know, there's not as much of an association with nodal disease. So it's not uncommon, particularly for skin cancer patients, both, you know, especially squamous cell carcinoma skin cancer patients that will present with PNI in the absence of nodal involvement. Um, you know, so that's something to be aware of that, you know, this is an independent process um, outside of regional spread of cancers. 
Again, showing you uh, some of the epidemiology. Again, kind of you can see variety of head and neck sites with the incidence of PNI, um, and you can see the cheek is probably one of the more common ones. Also, wanted to share what kind of symptoms that people present with when they present with clinical PNI. Um, this can be, you know, either numbness, it can be pain, it can be a painful numbness, very much, um, you know, uh, that you can see. It can be paresthesias, it can be burning, um, and then certainly if it involves, um, you know. Function, uh, mo functional nerves, like, you know, your mo motor neuron nerves, like the seventh nerve, um, you can just see, you know, facial palsy in patients when they come in. Um, PNI, you know, we often think of it just be involving one nerve, but that's not true. Um, there are connections, particularly between cranial nerve uh, V2 and 7 and V3 and 7, where you can have PNI in these tumors jump across nerves. And we'll talk a bit about that the need to cover the connections between these two nerves when you see patients with PNI in one or the other. Um, and you can kind of see that while majority of PNI is, is in a single nerve, you know, th th there are definitely, you know, about a third of patients can have involvement of multiple nerves um, in these patients. So again, as I mentioned, these three types of PNI that you should be aware of, um, incidental and microscopic, as I mentioned, these are patients where all you see this is a report, a, a pathology report, where it says PNI noted. Uh, these patients have no clinical symptoms or radiographic symptoms. And then clinical PNI, um, which can happen you know, years after their skin cancer diagnosis. So it's not uncommon to see perineural failures on the orders of, uh, I would say, two to 15 years out after a prior skin cancer diagnosis. Um, and these, you know, clinical symptoms present, as I mentioned, especially in the face, if they involve v, uh, um, trigeminal or facial nerve with either numbness or weakness of a nerve. Um, and oftentimes when you do imaging at the time of clinical PNI, um, you won't find anything on imaging and it can take on the order of multiple years before you see something on imaging. Radiographic PNI, um, you know, again, these patients typically have clinical findings, uh, but these radiographic um, findings can be very, very subtle early on in the natural history of the disease. So you really need a radiologist. So sometimes you don't actually see a visible tumor. What all you'll see is widening of the foramina um, you know, at the skull base. So, you know, if you see a widened trigem, a, a widened for, a foramen valley or foramen rotundum, um, your index of suspicion for PNI should be high in these patients. So why are we obsessing about this? Why are we even having a talk about this? Um, and the reason for this is PNI is a predictor for both local failures and, and, and can affect overall survival in patient or disease specific survival in patient. And so you can look at local control. Um, and so you can see that you know, when patients present with microscopic or incidental PNI for skin cancers, five-year local control you know, you know, is on the order of a, you know, about you know, 85 to 87%. Remember when these patients undergo MOS, they're told a cure rate of 99%. So you can see that PNI significantly affects local control. But if you have clinical PNI, your five-year local control, even with all appropriate therapy, is on the order of 50%. And once you progress to radiographic PNI, you know your your five-year you know local control is on the order of 25% with appropriate therapy, um, and this is looking at cause-specific survival. And you can see that there is a decrease in, in survival in these patients as well um, in, in terms of how these patients do. This is a very nice um, you know a meta-analysis published in JAMA a few years ago for JAMA dermatology looking at you know, local recurrence as well as disease-specific survival um, in patients with PNI. And so it's something to kind of, um, very good review article for all of you to, um, to read at some point. So just to kind of give you some summary of this article, when you look at incidental PNI, so again, microscopic PNI, you can see that you know, risk of local recurrence is on the order of you know, about 17% in these patients. Um, and you can see that this is disease-specific death, about 6% in these patients. So these patients are very, very treatable. And this is really a classic role for adjuvant radiotherapy, right? So um, even when patients undergo Mohs surgery, if there's any PNI, really those patients should be referred to see you to talk about adding you know, local radiation to the resection bed of these tumors. Um, so that you can provide them with long-term, you know, improved local control in these patients. When patients present with clinical PNI, you can see that local recurrence is very high in these patients. Um, you can see that it's on the order of about 
A third of patients will have local recurrences at, in five years. And the other thing to note is that, you know, disease specific death, that's what DSD here is, is 27% at five years. So you can see about a quarter of patients will die from PNI. So PNI is a, is a lethal diagnosis, particularly once it becomes clinical um, in these patients. And, and here they had clinical and radiographic, just to give you an idea. So we're gonna really, the rest of the talk, talk about these three, you know, um, these four nerves. So the three branches of the trigeminal nerve and then um, the facial nerve. And so one of the things that, you know, when you're thinking about PNI is to really understand whether somebody has operable disease or whether the disease is inoperable. Um, and so it, it does surgery matter. So obviously there are no randomized trials looking at the role of surgery plus radiation versus radiation alone in these patients. But for people that do a lot of you know, head, neck, and skin cancers, I will tell you that if patients have zone one disease, so and by zone one, I mean from the periphery of the skin to the skull base foramina, right? So in, in, in terms of you know, the ophthalmic branch of the facial nerve, uh, of the trigeminal nerve, that's up to the superior orbital fissure. Uh, V2, you know, ma the maxillary branch to foramen rotundum, V3 to foramen ovale, and then cranial nerve 7 to stylomastoid foramen. So if an otherwise young healthy patient presents with a perineural failure that is radiographically visible along the nerves, it is very reasonable for these patients to undergo surgery for resection, and the, patient, and the, sur the head and neck surgeons will basically you know, trace the nerve all the way to the skull base and resect disease in the nerve along, along this path. And, and I will say that, you know, it's a reasonable thing to consider debulking surgery in these patients. These, by definition, are going to be an R1 resection, if not an R2 resection, meaning that there's always going to be microscopic disease left behind, if not gross disease left behind in these patients. Zone two is going from the skull base, you know, to the next, along the intracranial path of the nerve, in, in case of the uh, trigeminal nerve to the Gusserian ganglion, the trigeminal ganglion cistern. And then case of the facial nerve, you know, up inside, you know, the internal auditory, lateral end of the internal auditory canal, um, you know, including basically the labyrinthine segment um, of, the, of the nerve and the geniculate ganglion. So these, you know, um, I, I put here operable, but it requires both significant skill and significant morbidity. You know, these patients are going to be left with some really devastating consequences of this surgery if the patient, if the surgeon decides to track these nerves intracranially. So this is almost never done um, in patients, and in most patients, you know, these patients, are, the patients who have zone two involvement, are going to be inoperable. Um, and then zone three is when the disease goes from these ganglion all the way, you know, into the cisterns or, you know, in, you know, now extending into the brainstem. So this, by definition, really is inoperable disease. And, and I would add here, this is incurable disease, um, really. These are the patients who are absolutely, the, if you look at, you know, five-year overall survival in patients that have zone three involvement of, of perineural invasion, it really is less than 20%. So when I meet these patients, you know, you have to be upfront that this is going to be the ultimate cause of their, their demise. And all that you're going to be able to do is really be able to palliate, so help them with their symptoms, especially if they have terrible pain, um, and to you know, maybe extend their survival, but these patients will ultimately die of their disease. Um, again, just showing you overall, survival for, you know, kind of looking at some numbers. This is, again, this data, by the way, uh, that I'm showing, sharing you is, is University of Florida data, which is probably the best data in p and um, in the U.S. And then showing you just, again, you know, how, how patients fail uh, with p and so patients that have, you know, um, you know clinical perineural uh, or radiographic per perineural invasion, you know, when they fail, you know, recurrence, you know, these recurrences are you can see that you know majority of recurrences are you know within the first four years of surgery and and within you know within the first four or five years of radiation, and typically when patients present with PNI, as I mentioned, zone one patients, you know, so these patients that I mentioned earlier, these are the patients you really want to be aggressive and treat, you know, both with surgery and radiation, because the reality is that with appropriate radi radiation. Um, you will, you know, you have a very good chance of curing these patients. So um, this is why we're going to talk about contouring because these are the patients you're trying to save um, and and keep them alive. Um, again, showing you some same data: disease-specific survival um, 
by zone one, zone two, and zone three. And as I mentioned, zone three, uh, you know, if you look at five year disease specific survival, it's terrible. Um, and 10 years, it's really, you know, 15% of 10 years. Um, and then, you know, as I mentioned, you know, patients uh, can have either single nerve involved or multiple nerves involved. Once tumors start jumping across nerves, it really is a sign of the biologically aggressive nature of their, their disease. Um, and these patients just don't do as well as you can see um, in here in these patients. Again, um, you can take a look at this, just kind of showing you some data about the role of radiation um, after a surgical excision or Mohs surgery for patients. This is primarily with, um, you know, a microscopic PNI, and you can see that radiation does a really good job uh, in terms of local control uh, for patients with microscopic PNI. It really improves it. So next, we're going to kind of focus on how do we treat PNI? What do you actually do once you see PNI in your patients? So for incidental PNI, as I mentioned, if it's just microscopic, it's an unnamed branch, it's low volume. So sometimes you will see pathology reports talk about extensive PNI or focal PNI. So this is talking about focal PNI. These patients, for the most part, for both mucosal malignancies and cutaneous malignancies, really just need radiation to the resection bed with generous margins. So if it's a skin cancer, you're going to wire the scar, you're going to put a healthy two, two and a half centimeter margin around there for, for, for covering the small branches of the, of, the, of the nerves in the resection bed, and you're gonna treat them with electrons. If it's a mucosal malignancy, you know, if, you're, if, you were, if you were otherwise going to put like a five millimeter CTV, you may wanna consider putting you know, a, a larger CTV in these patients, you know, uh, particularly, you know, if you're doing a, a dose painting type plan, you know, if you're doing your high risk CTV and your low risk CTV, you know, I typically add another five millimeters to whatever I would do without PNI. So if I'm going to do a five millimeter mar margin for my CTV for high risk CTV, I'm going to go to 10 millimeters. If I do a 10 millimeter margin for my low risk CTV around the primary resection bed, I'll go to 15 to 20, just being more generous in this area to cover those small, you know, small cutaneous nerves. The only time you should think of tracing the nerve all the way to the skull base, if not intracranially, is if that histology is adenoid cystic carcinomas. Uh, because we know that adenoid cystic carcinoma patients, even if with focal PNI, you know, in the in the in the in the salivary gland tumor, they can fail five, in that five to 15 year range all the way down up to the skull base. So, you know, adenoid cystic carcinomas, you really are going to tra trace that nerve all the way to the skull base. If patients have extensive microscopic PNI, you know, I think you have to kind of weigh the pros and cons. You know, if you can, you know, what I always think of is that, you know, if it's a locally advanced T stage and if this tumor involves a salivary gland or a paranasal sinus or oral cavity or nasopharynx, you know, I'm going to strongly consider tracing those nerves to the cranial nerve foramina. Um, so if I, if I know what that nerve is going to be, you know, I'll, I'll think of chasing them. So, you know, if it's a paranasal sinus tumor, you know, chasing V2 all the way to foramen rotundum, if not the cavernous sinus. Um, you know, nasopharynx, obviously you're going to treat, we always treat lots of nerves in that, in that skull base. Um, and then the salivary gland, depending on the location of the salivary gland, you know, either tracing cranial nerve five or seven to the skull base is reasonable in these patients. If a patient has clinical PNI, so this is a patient where they have no radiographic findings, uh, but clearly have numbness, weakness, and a known history of a skin cancer or a salivary gland cancer, and you're going to treat these patients you have to at least trace this to the skull base foramina. Um, and if there's radiographic disease, you have to trace this all the way to zone three, meaning that your volumes should end at the brainstem. Um, and then, you know, in patients who have radiographic PNI, particularly if they have like radiographic zone two findings or zone three findings, you know, not only are you going to trace the, the nerve back to the brainstem, but that you're going to strongly consider treating a a volume of the brainstem in that in you know to to that um, to a microscopic dose. So typically, you know, both cranial nerves uh, five and seven come come out in the pons. So those nuclei in the pons of the brainstem. So oftentimes, you know, we'll electively then treat the patient to um, you know 50, 54 grain these patients. Um, I'm showing you some other uh, indications for when to chase nerves. Um, you know, I think. That in patients who have, you know, uh, you know, a um, couple other things. I talked about extensive microscopic PNI. 
but certainly patients who are immunosuppressed, um, you know, really immunosuppression is a significant risk factor for both skin cancers, but also terrible skin cancers that fail in nerves. So you should, you can, that's sometimes a consideration. Um, certainly in this setting of a recurrent disease, it's, it's a consideration in these patients to trace nerves. So what doses do we treat patients to? So again, I'll say that there's no consensus here, right? So typically you are tracing nerves to organ tolerance or so an organ at risk tolerance. So typically, you know, um, and again, if you really are going to chase, you know, chase nerves intracranially, um, you know, you're even really pushing on tolerance. As Mariel will tell you, you know, we teach you that brainstem constraints are, you know, we typically say 54 gray, but if I'm tracing somebody, all, you know, somebody's disease all the way to the brainstem, I'm going to take the surface of the brainstem to 60 to 63 gray uh, because they have such bad disease, you know, we're, we're going to actually um, change the tolerances a bit and, uh, you know, really push, pu push dose uh, as much as possible. But for microscopic incidental PNI um, in patients, so these are patients, again, just, you know, your typical skin cancers, you know, where there's just pathology findings, you know, you, you're going to treat that resection bed with generous margins, and it depends on the dose fractionation. So if you're doing two gray per fraction, you know, 60 to 66 gray, if you're doing three gray per fraction for that re resection bed, 45 to 51 gray, three gray per fraction to the skin with electrons is very reasonable. I think if you're, you know, treating, you know, further, um, or if you're treating mucosal malignancy, so these are kind of the doses that we think of. So if you have gross PNI, you know, so it's an R2 resection or unresectable, you're going to treat the gross disease that is extracranial to 66 to 70 gray. You're going to treat the microscopic disease that's extracranial to 54 to 60 gray. So basically kind of following head and neck principles. If you have gross disease intracranially, you know, you're going to try to take that to at least 60 gray, um, you know, and you're going to be limited there by, by your optic structures, your brainstem and temporal lobes of the brain. Um, you know, if you can take a small volume of disease to 64 to 66 gray, you can consider doing that. It's very difficult oftentimes in these patients. And then if you're, you know, you know, covering microscopic paths of disease intracranially, typically 50 to 54 gray, trying to respect the tolerance of the intracranial structures. Uh, becomes important. This is a paradigm that you can kind of see, um, you know, at, at your perusal kind of, you know, when to chase, chase perineural invasion, kind of walks you through it. I'll, I'll leave this for you to review at a later point in time. So now the rest of the picture, uh, there's the talk is a bunch of pictures. We're going to just look at pictures and look at anatomy and talk about uh, these cranial nerves and how to trace them. So as I mentioned, um, you know, non-melanoma skin cancers, you know, cranial nerves five and seven, um, you know, salivary gland tumors of the heart palate, you know, typically V2, nasopharynx cancers, a variety of tumors, and then, you know, parotid malignancies, right? So parotid salivary gland malignancies, as we all know, cranial nerve seven basically divides the deep and the superficial lobes of the parotid gland. So you're always going to chase these tumors, um, chase the, um, the facial nerve in, in these patients. So again, um, just now showing you some anatomic paths of the nerve. Um, so, you know, your, your ophthalmic nerve, um, you know, as it comes out of the brainstem, goes to the trigeminal ganglion, goes into the cavernous sinus, exits the brain through the, your superior orbital fissure, and then um, comes out the skin, you know, through the roof of the orbit. Um, in, you know, there are multiple branches here, you know, um, typically we're thinking of the lacrimal branch or the frontal branch of these nerves. Um, for your V2, you know, as you know, similar path going through the cavernous sinus, exiting through foramen rotundum, it comes through the pterygopalatine fossa. As you know, this is something that we obsess about in virtually many, many head and neck cancers, particularly in nasopharynx cancers, you always wanna make sure you cover the pterygopalatine fossa in these patients. Um, and you can see that, you know, these tumors can, you know, V2 kind of can come from multiple different sites. So skin cancers, sinus cancers, nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal cancers, and certainly then um, sinonasal cancers and hard palate tumors. And then finally, the mandibular branch of the, of the trigeminal nerve. The, the key thing to remember that this nerve goes through Meckel's cave and foramen a valley, it does not go into the cavernous sinus and then exits out into the masticator space. Um, and these are tumors involving the lower third of the face or any tumor that really is invading into the mandible or masticator space, peripharyngeal space, floor of mouth, 
um, these are kind of the brain, you know, the sites of the tumors that can trace all the way back um, through, through B3. So again, showing you a pictorial ex uh, example of this. So you can see tumors up here um, going through um, basically the supraorbital foramen and going into the orbit, um, you know, middle third of the face going through the infraorbital foramen and going tracking along V2 and then lower third, you know, third of the face, your, your mandibular branch going through usually the mental foramen um, and tracking along for these patients. So again, showing you basically another kind of picture of just the innervation for skin. So when you're treating skin cancers to an idea of what branches you worry about. So basically you can see ophthalmic, maxillary, mandibular. Um, and then there are all these other nerves that we don't think of often, but that innervate the posterior um, part of your head and your neck in these patients. So let's start with the V1. This, in my opinion, is the hardest branch of the tri trigeminal nerve to treat. And, and you'll see why in just a few minutes. So here's a picture of somebody who has a skin cancer of the forehead. Um, you know, one of the highest risks, um, you know, is going to be tumors and kind of really in the forehead location for these patients. Um, there are two basically nerves that you have to worry about, the supraorbital nerve um, and then the supratrochlear nerve. Um, these foramina are literally next to each other. Um, and so I'll show you that in just a second. Um, and so the ophthalmic branch, basically, you know, it, it you know, this is, this actually um, is um, the, su the supraorbital fissure, not the superior orbital fissure. Um, but this inside the orbit is going to exit through the superior orbital fissure. Okay. Um, so let me kind of show you the example. So this is, um, if I show you a skin, you know, these tumors, I'll show you this in a minute. They usually, you know, if you can imagine, they're going to start right up here, a um, little bit higher, and above the above the globe is where you have the supraorbital foramen and the supratrochlear foramen. They're going to enter the skin through there, and then they're going to travel right along here. They're going to travel right along here, the, the you know, along the medial rectus, and then they swerve in, and then they travel right above the optic nerve and then they exit right here through the superior orbital fissure. So you can see why these tumors are extremely difficult to treat because you are going to be treating significant portions of the orbit if you're going to chase V1 in these, in these patients. Um, and then again, just showing you a picture of the cavernous sinus so that you remember that you know, the multiple nerves besides V1 and V2 go through there. Um, you know, three, four, and six are also right in this location. Um, so you can see where these are. So here's just, again, showing you an example of a patient that has involvement of V1, where there's now disease in the cavernous sinus in this patient. Um, so you can see that. And then here's Meckel's cave. So it's another patient with disease here in the Meckel's cave. Um, I find that if you want to, to track Meckel's cave, it's best. So you can see here's that cavernous sinus. Here's Meckel's cave. It's best seen on a coronal view um, of a CT or an MRI in these patients. Um, and then, you know, as it comes out of Meckel's cave, and here you can see, here's the trigeminal nerve. Uh, one of the conditions that I treat a lot is trigeminal neuralgia. Um, and so, you know, this is the trigeminal nerve right there. And so you can see um, once from Meckel's cave, it goes right into the trigeminal nerve and can then enter the brainstem through the dorsal root and entry zone right here in these patients. So let's kind of show you some pictures. So here's a, pic, uh, a kind of a, a plan for a patient with involvement of a skin cancer with extensive PNI along V1. So again, showing you the, the supraorbital foramen and the, and the supratrochlear foramen. Um, and you can, you, can, you can see that these sit kind of right next to each other. So you're gonna draw usually both of these and you can see that these are right along the medial uh, aspect of the anterior portion of the bony orbit. Um, and this is what your CTV is going to look like in these patients. So you're basically going to draw, draw the, the foramina and then draw a nice five millimeter margin around that for CTV. Um, then these nerves basically join within the orbit and they run over the superior rectus muscle and the, the levator palpebrae muscles to, um, to form the, the frontal nerve. And then they run posterior through the superior orbit. So as you rise up in the orbit, these tumors basically swing in this way, um, you know, really going over the, the orbital musculature. And so this is what your CTV looks like when you're treating these. You're literally treating the very top portion of the globe is going to be in your CTV um, when you're treating these patients. 
And then here you again you're looking at these the la lateral rectus muscle and in this is kind of uh, the, the superior orbital fissure is going to lie right up here. So right here. So here you can see again here's that optic nerve, here's the globe, and then here's that superior orbital fissure right here. So when you're treating these patients, basically your volumes are going to look like something like this. If I were to take my brush and draw, you're going to cover all this area. So you're going to cover the posterior aspect um, of the retina. You're going to cover the optic nerve um, because you can see here's the optic canal right there. And then here's the superior orbital fissure right next to it, right lateral to it. So it's very hard to miss the nerve if you're going to treat this nerve path. And now this is that intracranial nerve path to show you. So here's that superior orbital fissure and then now going into the cavernous sinus in these patients. So here's one of my patients. I'm just gonna show you some slices here. So again, you can see as drawing in the foramina, drawing in the nerve path. And in this patient, there's actually gross disease, which helps me, right? So what you see in yellow is actually gross disease that you can see in here in this patient. Um, you can see there's bolus put on the skin on top of this. And you can see how, as I was showing you, this loops in from the medial aspect to the lateral aspect to, to come out here at the superior orbital fissure. Um, and then here's that superior orbital fissure um, in light blue that's drawn in. And then you can see here coming into the cavernous sinus. And this is what this looks like in a sagittal plane and a coronal plane. So you can get an idea of what we're treating here, right? So you can see it's very hard to treat this to therapeutic head and neck cancer doses when you're treating gross disease. So I can tell you what we did in this particular patient. We treated this elective volume to 54 gray. I treated the gross disease with a very small volume to about 60 gray. It's really hard to go beyond 60 gray. And obviously this patient was consented for a um, variety of really um, serious complications like keratitis, so risk of corneal ulceration, risk of retina radiation, retinopathy, um, and then ultimately optic neuritis and enucleation. So this patient was consented for everything. Um, this patient actually is now five years out from his radiotherapy um, and actually now has um, stage three non-small cell lung cancer. One of my partners is treating him. He's actually done really, really well in terms of his skin cancer. This, he had a CR. Um, unusual, but he did very well um, in, in here. So you can kind of just see these volumes. Um, this is again, kind of showing you these CTV volumes for V1. And you can see basically, in this case, the entire orbit um, was included. Uh, what I didn't tell you about this particular patient was that this patient is, was unfortunate enough to have a V1 recurrence after having a prior V2 recurrence several years prior. So I had already gotten radiation down here. Um, so we were trying to match some fields inferiorly for this patient. Um, but you can see this is what this looks like. So you can see why this becomes so challenging to treat in these patients. Any questions, anyone, about uh, cranial nerve uh, V1? All right, we'll go on to V2. So V2 is much easier to uh, trace uh, and treat. So these are pa patients, again, as I said, if it's a skin cancer involving the middle third of the face, um, and these tumors, if they, they, they usually start mid-face, they go in through the inferior orbital fissure, so right underneath your, the, your bony orbit, um, and then they can travel through the pterygopalatine fossa, foramen rotundum, cavernous sinus, and end up in Meckel's cave. Again, kind of showing you this example right here. This is what this would look like. So this is on a coronal plane. You can see this is what an infraorbital foramen looks like. And you can see compared from you know, left to right, this foramen is widened. You can see it's almost twice the size. And this should be an indication to you that there is something abnormal about this and there is risk that, that there is concern for PNI in this patient. Um, so showing you again on a CT axial slice, you can see this very, very well. So this is going to be literally at the junction of the bony orbit and the maxillary sinus. And you can see this foramina pretty well on a CT. So here's that foramina drawn in for you. So you can see this. Um, these tumors then track from this foramina, they actually track along the lateral wall of the maxillary sinus. So they come right along in here and then they hook right here into the, the pterygopalatine fissure or the pterygopalatine fossa right here. And then they travel intracranially here through foramen rotundum in the vidian canal. They can go right, right inside here, um, these patients. Again, um, I won't 
dwell a lot on this, but you know in nasopharynx patients, you are always, always going to cover this area uh, because you know that uh, nasopharynx cancers oftentimes will spread intracranially through, through this, these paths. So once they, uh, then they kind of similarly come into the cavernous sinus as I showed you. So these are just showing you some volumes of the cavernous sinus. Um, and they can end up in, in Meckel's cave right here. So here again, showing you Meckel's cave, showing you that trigeminal nerve. Here's the pons in this patient. Um, again, now just showing you some volume. So this is a patient with skin cancer. Um, you can see here's the, the infraorbital frame, foramen. You can see the, the nerve, CTV, some PTV volumes here. Um, and then this nerve loops along, as I show, told you, the lateral wall of the maxillary sinus and goes into the pterygopalatine fissure. And so here you can see what these volumes often look like. Um, one of the things I always have to tell residents is to make sure that you, when you're doing these CTVs that you have some margin around the nerve path, you know, here into, you know, you're here kind of in the infratemporal fossa, masticator space, make sure that you're covering generously there. Um, and that your volumes are also covering some portion inside the maxillary sinus because the walls of the maxillary sinus here are very, very thin and these tumors can go right through them. Um, and here you are in the pterygopalatine fossa, uh, fossa right there. Um, and then foramen rotundum, I will say that so foramen rotundum is usually right at this junction as it goes from the pterygopalatine fossa and, and goes intracranially. These require a really thinly sliced CT. So I will tell you that even here, we had to change our slice thickness to 0.25 millimeters or even, right, Mariel? Is it that right? We're down to 0.15. 0 0.15, yes. Uh, and it's exactly for these cases. So when, when I know that somebody has P and I and I'm going to chase nerves, we're down to really 0.15 millimeter slices because especially to find foramen rotundum because it is so, so small that if you do standard cut CT slices, like one millimeter CT slices, you are not gonna see them. Um, you will just go right through there in these patients. And then one of the things that I mentioned earlier of, of these tumors jumping across nerves, this is one of the, the sites where you can see this, where you can have communication between the maxillary branch of the trigeminal nerve and the facial nerve. Um, and this is often basically through the greater superficial petrosal nerve um, and the virian nerve and the virian canal. So these tumors can basically jump from one nerve to the other um, in these patients. And this is where that virian canal is, as I was showing you earlier, um, kind of. Uh, let's see, I'll show you. It's kind of right in this area. Again, these are not thick enough, uh, thin enough to be able to see. So again, this is somebody who had a palate tumor and then they're basically treating the hard palate and they're treating bilateral nerves. Um, and you can see here, you know, basically treating the greater and lesser palatine foramina right here. So this is the initial volumes. And then perfect, here you go. So here's the, as I was showing you, you know, pterygopalatine fossa, foramen ovale, I mean, sorry, foramen rotundum and the virian canal right here. So this is where these tumors connect to. So, you have to make sure that you cover the virian canal to, co to basically um, cover that connection between the facial nerve and the, the maxillary branch at the greater superficial petrosal nerve in these patients. Um, this is just another example of kind of showing you a more locally advanced patient where they decided to treat all the way to the IAC. Um, and so see, when you're treating these tumor, facial, uh, facial nerve tumors to the IAC, um, you are not sparing the cochlea, right? You're gonna treat that entire way through in these patients. So here's an, a patient, of, a different patient of mine. So this is a patient of mine that I, I just treated in the last year, a young woman, 32 year old, who developed an adenoid cystic carcinoma of the maxillary sinus, who came in with both V2 and V3 numbness. Um, and these are post-op volumes for her. Um, and this is merged with the pre-op um, MRI. So you can kind of get an idea of where the initial gross disease was and what these volumes look like. So because this is an adenoid cystic patient, um, I did not treat, uh, actually I did treat nodes in this lady, but you can see kind of these volumes that I've done here. Again, you know, basically treating the resection bed. Um, you can see post-op, the anatomy is really, really altered because of the extent of her surgery, uh, but covering all the skull base foramina here, covering the, um, both uh, intracranially covering um, the uh, cavernous sinus and Meckel's cave in this patient. So to kind of give you an idea here. Um, 
And this patient, I because her tumor was so extensive, extensive I actually even covered um, really, I was really generous of the skull base because her tumor went all the way into the ethmoid sinus. Um, and so you can see we even covered um, the superior orbital fissure in this patient. The mandibular branch. Um, so these patients can either present with tumors in the mental foramen uh, right up here or in the um, alveolar foramen or the mandibular foramen, which is right in the mandible right here. Um, and so you can see what these volumes typically look like. So you're in, so when you're chasing V3, the key point to remember is you cannot spare the mandible. Mandible is not an organ at risk. Mandible is target uh, because you have to cover these connections between the mental foramen and, and you know, here the mandibular foramen in these patients. So you can see that you're treating big portions of the mandible. If this patient would have had surgery here, that patient would have had a mandibulectomy. They would have actually taken this portion of the mandible out in these patients. Um, and then V3 basically you know, travels medial to the lateral pterygoid. Um, so again, now you're look, looking at that skull base here. So you can see medial pterygoid, medial pterygoid plate, lateral pterygoid plate, lateral pterygoid. Um, and the nerve travels really right medial to, uh, medial to that lateral pterygoid. So you're gonna be covering this area very generously. And this is again to kind of show you where masticator space is usually in patients. Um, and then it enters into the foramen ovale. So these are very easy to see. Um, again, you know, it basically looks like a teardrop in most patients. And so you can see foramen ovale here on the right, and you can see foramen ovale here on the left. Um, and then from foramen ovale, it goes into Meckel's cave. So the end result is pretty similar across you know, most of these patients. Um, again, just showing you some volume. So lower lip cancer patients often can have V3 involvement. Um, so be very um, you know, cognizant when a lower lip patient presents with numbness prior to biopsy or prior to surgery, your index of suspicion for PNI should be very high in these patients and you, you'd, be, you'd be tracing this. So here are those CTV volumes right here. Um, then again, showing you the mandibular foramen. So again, you can see these CTV volumes you know, along the inferior alveolar nerve in these patients. Um, and then you're now chasing this up into the skull base. So here's that um, foramen ovale. Here's the tergopalatine fossa. So here's foramen ovale is pretty easy to treat right here. So here's a patient of mine, again, showing you some volume. So this is a guy, um, you know, gentleman who had a history of uh, what was called a right trigeminal schwannoma. And this schwannoma was inside, it was intracranial. It was in the trigeminal nerve. And this patient was treated with gamma knife radiosurgery actually at UCSF uh, a long time ago. And then, you know, literally, um, I want to say, God, it was seven to 10 years later, he presented with a submental mass. And the submental mass was biopsied and it came back as a malignant peripheral nerve sheet tumor. So very, very interesting, right? Um, so case. So this patient underwent surgery. Um, so he underwent removal of this submental malignant peripheral nerve sheet tumors. So MPNST, for the, as you all know, these are like your worst sarcomas, right? They do terribly. So these patients absolutely need surgery. So in this patient, I actually saw him pre-op. You know, he, um, he wanted to know if I would treat him with radiosurgery, like he'd gotten radiosurgery for his trigeminal schwannoma. I said, absolutely not. You need surgery because these are terrible sarcomas. You need needs to be resected. So you can see he had a resection. He has a plate here. Um, and then you can see these post-op volumes and you can see he's underwent this mandibulectomy. So I literally, um, I, one of the other things I always tell people, right, in head and neck, symmetry is everything. So when you're treating something on the left and it's completely abnormal, or in this case, treating something on the right, it's completely abnormal. Use your landmarks on the contralateral side to see where things should be. Um, and I'll give you a great example of this, right? So here's this post-op setting. I'm trying to treat that mandibular foramen um, and I can see it right here. So I know it had to be somewhere right in this location. So literally a plumb line across and I know what, what to cover. So you can see this. And then as I told you, these tumors are usually medial to the pterygoid, uh, lateral pterygoid. So again, treating this right here. And then ultimately, you know, I stopped my volumes in this patient right at um, foramen ovale because his intracranial path was already treated previously by gamma knife. So I, I wasn't gonna retreat that. So you can see what these volumes look like. Um, and so basically, again, you know, there's always dose painting going on here. So um, anything closer to the skin, 
away from the skull base, you know, post-op doses, as I mentioned, 60 to 66 gray. So in this patient, you can, I'll tell you the yellow here got 66 gray, so the immediate resection bed. Um, the green got 60 gray. And then uh, in this patient, since I was going only to foramen ovale, I actually took everything to 60 gray um, in this patient. But were I to chase intracranially, I would have, I would have you know, created a third volume going to 54 gray. So facial nerve, um, you guys all remember the five branches of the facial nerve, right? Uh, to Zanzibar by motor car. Um, so you know it has an upper, upper motor neuron and a lower motor neuron. Um, and so you can see facial nerve palsies that are partial palsies, depending on where, what branches of the facial nerves are involved. Or if you have a huge chunking parotid tumor, you will see a complete facial nerve per, you know, paralysis uh, because you basically have gotten the, 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 the nerve right at its ganglion. Um, so just another example of what this can look like on the skin when some patients present with a parotid tumor. Uh, but this is like a, basically a resection bed of a post-op patient. Um, I, for giggles, kind of drew in this little circle. You cannot see the facial nerve, okay? So just so you know, you can only see facial nerve at the time of surgery. You cannot see facial nerve on imaging. It is exquisite. It's very, very small to see. And the trick question always is, where is the facial nerve? And you know, basically, uh, you know, it's an anatomic uh, location where it basically, you know, we divide the deep and superficial lobe based on where the facial nerve is. So, but you're not going to see this unless you see a honking tumor in there. You're not going to be able to actually see the nerve uh, in here. But facial nerve tumors, you're going to treat the entire parotid bed uh, in these patients and track that to the stylomastoid foramen. And the stylomastoid foramen is very easy to see, right? Mastoid, so air cells right here, styloid process. The area right here is that stylomastoid foramen, so you can see right here. Um, I will tell you that generally most head and neck people, when they treat any parotid malignancy, the threshold to, take, to treat all the way to the stylomastoid foramen is very low. Because honestly, there is no added morbidity here and if you're at all worried about a nerve failure, you want to cover at least to the stylomastoid foramen because it's so easy for you to treat that. that. What the hard part in these patients is tracing this further um, as it goes into the petrous part of the temporal bone and the IAC. So the decision to treat, I would say, to zone one, super easy. It's the zone two, three decisions that become hard because now you're talking about giving somebody hearing loss um, in these patients. So. You know, basically, again, just showing you some 3D, uh, some, uh, some uh, pictures from Netter here, uh, and again, then showing you some CT slices here. So, you know, when you start coming into that petrous temporal bone, this is the, the medial aspect of the mastoid air cells is what you are going to cover in, in your CTVs. Um, and then you're going to go up and cover basically all the way, you know, looping it inside, covering all the way into the IAC. So here you can see, here, you know, here's your cochlea, here's the IAC. So you're basically covering all the way up to the internal acoustic meatus um, in these patients. So you're going to treat all of this in these patients. Um, and then, you know, the other thing that you have to worry about is that there's also a communication between the parotid gland and cranial nerve V, uh, v um, you know, the trigeminal nerve, particularly trigeminal nerve, it's V3. Um, and, and that's the connection right here is by the, or it's due to the, or the connection by the auricular temporal nerve in these patients. Um, and so, you, you know, if you're at all worried, you know, if you're treating, especially an adenoid cystic patient, you know, ad, an adenoid cystic carcinoma of the, of the parotid gland, you really should cover the connection between 7 and V3 in these patients, um, you know, by covering the, auricular, uh, the auriculotemporal nerve up to the foramen of valley in these patients. And this is fairly straightforward to do. Um, again, showing you some, some CTVs here. So here's that CTV of covering the parotid bed. Um, and you can see kind of coming in here to cover the stylomastoid foramen. And so here's that stylomastoid foramen, as I mentioned, and then covering the petrous portion of that temporal bone. So this is what this looks like. So you can see residual parotid gland here, the petrous portion of the temporal bone here, um, and then covering the stylomastoid foramen here. So pretty generous. And then here's trying to cover that auricular temporal uh, branch connection to the uh, to the foramen ovale, so this is very straightforward. You basically, here's that foramen ovale and you're covering basically this path right in, in this patient. Um, again, showing you same, same pictures here. This is another one of my patients. So this is a patient, 77-year-old uh, patient who came in 
uh, very, this is a more complex patient, came in with complete facial nerve palsy as well as V2, V3 numbness. So again, showing you that example of multiple nerves involved in this patient. So the patient underwent a paradectomy, uh, was noted to have a tumor there, and then basically here you can see us radiating um, the resection bed. So you can see what these volumes look like in here. So up here, you can see covering the style of mastoid foramen, and then you can see that the patients had surgery here in the petrous portion uh, of the temporal uh, bone. So you can, again, for symmetry, you can see normal anatomy, post-op bed. You can see how we covered that post-op bed basically up here. Um, and then you can see, you know, in this patient covering the connections, not only did I cover this, this patient's tumor, not only, you know, gone into V3 here, you know, uh, but also to V2. So in this patient, you can see we covered not only foramen ovale, but also foramen rotundum and teravipalatine fossa right here. And here you can see we covered Meckel's cave, cavernous sinus in this patient. So you can see what these volumes look like. Um, and so there is morbidity here, right? So this patient is going to lose hearing from radiation. So you can see that um, these are kind of the paths that we treat. That we, that we treat. Um, I'm gonna end my cases before we kind of go into a little bit of contouring um, is this is the worst case that I've probably ever seen. A uh, 68 year old woman who came in with a seven year history of right-sided facial numbness. She had everything under the sun that was diagnosed for this numbness. A HSV in infection, a monoclonal gam gammopathy of unknown significance and ultimately Bell's palsy. She ultimately came with this. So you can see this is the natural history of an untreated perineural failure. This lady had history of multiple non-melanoma skin cancers over her lifetime, uh, but this was missed. And this gets missed at the best of institutions. Um, this happened to be at UCLA. This patient was missed for seven years, uh, just literally went to rheumatologists, dermatologists, neurologists, you name it, uh, a allergy person, a, a lymphoma person, uh, and ultimately somebody did an MRI and this is when they found out. So you can see this patient has recurred all, everywhere, um, disease in the cavernous sinus, disease you know, along the dura right here, and then disease inside the, you know, into the brainstem. And so here you can see you know, both T1 and T2 changes um, here in this patient. So this is the kind of patient where you have to treat the brainstem, right? There's disease in the brainstem. So you can see what these volumes look like. Um, this is actually one of the first patients I treated with protons. Um, so this, uh, given how extensive her disease was, so this is what I treated in this patient. Uh, she did very well. Her pain got a lot better, but unfortunately, six months later, she presented with a cord compression. Um, and so this is, this is how these patients with perineural failures die. They die um, really through retrograde, uh, you know, progression of these tumors where they go into through the skull base, through these foramina, into the brainstem, um, and they generally die a brainstem death. Um, so that's, the, that's the, the, how these patients unfortunately expire. So to conclude uh, for PNI, um, incidental or microscopic PNI for skin cancers, just treat the resection bed. For mucosal squamous cell carcinomas, if it's focal, just make sure that you put, add a generous margin to your resection bed. If there is extensive PNI, or if it is a named nerve, then you really should trace that nerve to the skull base. If it's an adenoid cystic carcinoma, even with just incidental or microscopic PNI, you should at least cover to the skull base, if not intracranially. I, I would say really with modern radiotherapy, if you're using IMRT, um, and I'm gonna let Muriel talk a minute about that, kind of the IMRT versus protons, there's always a big discussion. Um, Muriel, what are your thoughts? Um, I think it kind of depends on your confidence with your setup and, and that sort of thing, your imaging. I think we do a pretty good job with modern day VMAP, um, kind of being yeah, able to- Yeah, I would agree. I would absolutely agree with that. I actually think that VMAP plans are generally provide way better coverage. Um, so I will say that I live in a city where I have access to protons and patients often come asking for protons. So oftentimes I'll do a proton plan. I think protons are great when you have v, you know, zone three disease or really bad zone two disease, especially in a young patient, because it will decrease that you know, integral dose to your temporal lobes of the brain. Um, and that's where you'll get. But if you're looking for really good coverage, I think VMAT plans provide amazing coverage. 
uh, with uh, you know with protons, even with intensely modulated proton radiotherapy. You remember, you know, you're you're always going to be limited by the number of beams that you're using, right? No matter how much modulation you do. Um, so for those of you that are old enough from the early days of IMRT, when we did fixed field IMRT, um, you know, if you use three or five, B, you know, fields, you know, you, you can only modulate so much in those fields. So the coverage is not nearly as good with protons, um, I, I find anyway. Um, clinical PNI, as I mentioned, you know, really, really, you know, this is where your exam is completely paramount and the history is paramount. Order the imaging. But if you don't see imaging findings, don't ignore them. You know, you, you got to still treat these patients and treat the nerves. Um, and then, as I mentioned, you're going to treat these nerves, you know, you know, either up to the cavernous sinus, Meckel's cave, or in the internal auditory canal. Um, and then radiographic PNI, as I said, zone one, you know, curable. Zone two, you, you can cure about half the patients. So these are the patients really to be aggressive for. Zone three patients, you have to just be upfront because your cure, your odds of cure are so, so low. Um, so oftentimes you're treating these patients really for palliation. Uh, and when you treat these zone three patients, you wanna treat these patients all the way to the brainstem. Um, so I wanted to switch to uh, this on prono. I don't know, and, and this is really for you guys to look at and play with when you get a chance um, at any time. But I wanted to kind of show you these volumes in. So this is a real life patient of mine actually on treatment, undergoing treatment right now. Um, a lady in her 70s with multiple malignancies, history of breast cancer, history of melanoma in situ, and probably a non-melanoma skin cancer at some point in her lifetime. And this is the same classic story. This lady presented with facial pain, I mean facial num uh, a, a facial nerve paralysis now like seven plus years ago. Um, and really um, just was misdiagnosed for a long time. She again got multiple diagnoses and she got multiple imaging. And, and because of her paralysis, she actually got multiple like random biopsies of the parotid gland uh, and they were all negative. And then about seven or eight years after her palsy, she presented with a mass in her parotid gland um, that was obviously biopsied and came back as a squamous cell carcinoma. It was a cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. She underwent a parotidectomy, and then I, we're treating her right now. Um, she did have a neck dissection, but a very limited neck dissection of only seven nodes out. So in this lady, we're treating the neck and, and, the, um, um, and the path of the nerve. So I just wanted to kind of show you what these volumes look like. Um, so I'm going to show you, basically, um, we don't have the fusion here, but this is this was, uh, if you can imagine, this was her gross disease, where her disease was. She underwent a prodectomy. And then this is that high risk volume, really just right in the resection bed where I'm giving 66. So in the post op setting, I'm very conscientious of limiting the amount of volume that I'm going to go to 66 gray in these patients uh, because they've had extensive surgery, especially if I'm going to add chemotherapy. And we can talk a minute or two about that at the very end. So this is just the resection bed of that dominant mass. And you can see, basically, um, this is getting 66 gray. So you can see it's not even all of the parotid gland, but just where that mass was within the parotid gland, uh, with about a seven millimeter mar anatomic margin getting 66 gray. Uh, the next volume here I have is that intermediate dose cloud where now I'm chasing the nerves and the remainder of the parotid gland. So you, um, I'll kind of start up here. So, so you can, actually, let me start from the bottom so you can see. So here is kind of just me drawing, again, symmetry is everything. So really looking at the contralateral side because the gland has been excised. So this is the, you can see my volumes of the parotid bed right here. Um, you can see that, you know, I'm covering both deep lobes and superficial lobes. And you can see here's that mastoid process, uh, the ma mastoid, here's the styloid process. We're coming into the stylomastoid foramen. Again, it's been, it's been surgically removed here but you can see covering that, that generously here. And then here covering that petrous portion of the uh, temporal bone here. So you can see coming in there. So this is, that's what this is covering, this posterior aspect. Um, and again, here you can see just covering the skull base pretty generously. And then here is that connection from seven to V3. So here is, if I turn on 
Foramen ovale. I know I have it here. Perfect. So here's the Foramen ovale. You can see, so you can see, again, this is covering that connection. So this is now going to 60 gray. And then I'm going to turn my low dose on. So then you can see my low dose covers way more. So now my low dose volume basically covers the, the intracranial path of that cranial nerve seven. So you can see here is, you know, here's that cochlea right there. Um, I'm sure I could change the windowing. Let me see. Okay. So you can see here, here's the cochlea, here's the inner ear, here's the internal auditory, uh, the, the IAC, the internal auditory canal basically. And you can see that the volumes are going all the way in to cover that in this patient. Um, and then in this patient, I'm also covering post auricular nodes. So you can see that's why you can see this little tail going down here. And then all of the neck in this patient, you can see, so this is the neck basically then, okay, let me see if I can now, there we go. Um, you can see I'm treating the ipsilateral neck basically to the low dose cloud in this patient. So all the way um, down. So you can see basically covering levels two, one B, five, and then level four nodes. So covering everything. So these cases are never easy. They're very tricky, um, but really you can, you know, especially in these post-op settings. So, you know, this, this woman had really zone one disease ultimately, um, even though she had, you know, lots of clinical findings of her perineural invasion. Um, but these are the kind of patients where you should really be aggressive and cover. Um, and then, as we were saying earlier, you know, these are the patients, you know, really, we will take the surface of the brainstem to, you know, up to 60 gray easily. And that's very easy to do that. So, these are the patients, Marilyn, you want to talk a bit about what else we do for brainstem dose? Yeah, we'll um, take the surface to 60 or 63 if um, we need to, depending on where the gross disease is relative to it. Um, we can spare the rest of the brainstem, so you can always make kind of a, a part of the brainstem that's cropped a couple millimeters away to kind of ensure that you're still getting good gradients across the rest of it. Um, same thing when you're chasing anything that's near the optic nerves and the chiasm. Um, we're always going to want to be making sure that we're, um, you know, deciding whether or not we want to um, meet the constraints for the true uh, structure itself, or if we want to add um, a planning target at risk, like a PRV margin on there to kind of account for daily setup. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we certainly, especially if it's something's far enough away, I mean, definitely adding a PRV makes sense. We'll usually do a one millimeter PRV for anything intracranially, um, just to to be, you know, to have some, some margin. Um, but these are the kind of cases, I mean, so I will tell you, as I was mentioning earlier about the V1 case, where you really have to make a, a conscientious decision to balance between the you know, the goals of your therapy, if you want to be aggressive and cure them, and the potential, you know, morbidity from therapy. So, you know, we have a lot of those discussions, you know, where you are going to intentionally exceed the tolerance of either the optic nerve, you know, on that ipsilateral side, or the globe on, you know, and, and, and counsel them very much about, you know, what the risk benefits are. Um, and so, you know, that's really shared decision making with your patients in, in those instances. My last comment about chemotherapy, right? So unfortunately, not a lot of data about perineural invasion and chemotherapy. Um, there's been one trial to date from Australia that I actually looked at weekly carboplatin for these extensive PNI cases um, and showed no improvement in you know, disease-free survival or distant metastasis survival. Having said that, most people that do a lot of this, including myself, you know, if there's ever a possibility of adding a radio sensitizer in a, in a relatively young or healthy patient, uh, we will extrapolate from head and neck cancers, mucosal head and neck cancers, and ask for platinum in these patients. And honestly, though, I think it really just helps the radiation oncologist feel a little bit better about, you know, giving a bit of a discount in terms of your dose, right? Because you're never going to be able to treat the intracranial gross disease to 70 gray. Uh, you know, you're going to make a judgment call kind of somewhere between 60 and 66 depending on how aggressive you're going to be. Um, so having a radio sensitizer is reasonable. 
Now, immunotherapy, um, you know, obviously it's the new and big exciting thing, and we all know that cutaneous malignancies in particular have a very high uh, mutational burden. And so, you know, the, the potential therapeutic benefit of immunotherapy probably is going to be at its best in skin cancers and cutaneous malignancies. Uh, but just remember, you know, so far the data, I know everybody wants to do immunotherapy, but the data is not great. You know, um, response rates are really on the order of, you know, you know, in in mucosal malignancies on the order of like 30%. In cutaneous, you know, squamous cell carcinomas, response rates are probably about 50, 60%. But sustained cures are very, very low. And so what I always tell people is that, you know, you can certainly think of immunotherapy. It should be either, you know, uh, there, are, there are no ongoing trials of combining it with radiation. But immunotherapy really cannot replace what your local regional radiation in this in, in these cases. So um, something just to be aware of. All right, any questions? I can't. Oh, chat. Oh, okay. Sorry. I just looked at these. Um, okay. So there was a question of for adenocystic carcinomas without any microscopic PNI, do we still treat to the skull base? Yes. I think the answer is yes. Um, you always, always want to treat to skull base in these patients. Um, if not, you know, to zone two, uh, because we know that adenocystic carcinomas will always fail initially along the path of the nerve. Um, okay, then uh, I had another question here. If the patient presents with clinical PNI, numbness or pain, but surgical pathology shows no PNI, would you still cover the nerve? Yes, uh, I would cover the nerve. Um, absolutely. I think this is what I was trying, the point that I was trying to make was that if you have somebody who has clinical perineural symptoms, but even if the pathology doesn't show it and or there are no imaging findings, you should cover the nerve. Uh, because basically you've just caught them in that clinical window where they have symptoms, but a radiographic tumor, you know, along the nerve is not quite formed yet. So you should do that. Um, another question here was, is there an atlas or resource for contouring nerves? You know, there are a couple of really good papers um, that I've attached here, but really otherwise not. That's why, um, you know, I, I put in a lot of examples with pictures in this talk that you would have these for you. Um, as you contour these cases. But generally, generally no, uh, there are no great atlases um, like nasopharynx atlases that we have or other head and neck atlases that we have. All right, Becky, any other questions you got, Becky? I, I, these are all private questions here. Oh, that's, that explains it. I, could, I didn't see any of okay. them here. Um, Okay, but nothing I see here. All right. Okay, but. Uh, all right, any, any other questions? Rochelle, Ben? Um, no, thank you. That was a really, really good lecture. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was really comprehensive. Thank you so much. And thank you, Mariel, for being here too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. My plug for you, use photons. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But no, really, <laughs> photon-based planning is really, so I, I, this is why I wanted to kind of have Mariel here just so that you guys, but really VMAT, VMAT has changed the game, um, I will say. So these, as you can imagine, were exquisitely difficult to treat in the era of 2D radiotherapy or even 3D conformal radiotherapy because you could not really sculpt the dose around these critical intracranial structures. Um, and so you really were not, so when you look at older data, I would, I would absolutely take it with a grain of salt because all of that, even all the Florida data really of the use of adjuvant 